Um, Maria, thank you so much for joining me for a discussion about women's health, about the investment in women's health and the trends that we see in the space. So let's start with a basic uh, definition, an overview. How do you even define women's health? Which topics are key in this area? Because, for example, fertility is very much related to men as well. That's true. Thank you so much for inviting me to the podcast. Uh, such a great, uh, a big fan and such a great place to be. And uh, women's health is a very broad topic, and I'm sure we'll touch upon many, many interesting subtopics today. So how I see women's health, an area which I've been now good six, seven years, I would say, and the intersection of technology and, and, and women's health. So I would say it's an area of healthcare that really focuses on unique biological, social, behavioral uh, factors that affect well-being of women. That's in a nutshell, right? Um, and then we can build upon that. So we can say, oh, it includes a broad range of different issues that women face or maybe uh, phases of their lives, such as fertility, so reproductive health and reproductive phase, uh, which can be then further branched down into fertility or infertility, um, you know, sexual health, maternal health, mental health related to maternal health, gynecological health in general, other conditions that might, might disproportionately affect women, right? Because uh, there are many, for example, depression or Alzheimer's uh, and so on. And then um, I would say that women's health as a category definitely um, initially started with the main focus on reproductive health. We, we have to highlight that. And that's why I would say there's way more maybe innovation or awareness or tech stuff or gadgets or apps related to women's reproductive health, um, understandably so, but women are not just reproductive machines, right? So we are finally seeing a bit of a renaissance in other areas of women's health, such as, for example, menopause or broader hormonal health, hormone health, um, which I think is a really, really good step forward to um, just raising more awareness about what really women's health is. Mm -hmm. I wanted to uh, pick your brain on something, and that is that um, women's health to a degree is also connected to the question of uh, equality. Mm -hmm. And I think that we see a, an interesting shift in the debates around women's health. You know, uh, when trying to say that we are equal, we want the same conditions. But now with the rise of the awareness of the specifics of the women's body, uh, everything that you mentioned, menopause, uh, fertility, uh, uh, menstruation-related uh, challenges. We're now almost saying we want to be equal, but we have special needs. You know, so how do you, how do you see the whole discourse that's uh, evolving around women's health? That's an excellent question, <clears throat> because by default, if you require a special treatment of any kind, there's no equality in that, right? I think... As all, all, as with everything in life, there's always a, a you know, it's a thin line between how do we cater to this group of women, patients, whatever, so they can feel comfortable without the others, in this case, men, biological men, not feeling that they are get, getting less or they are, they are somehow sidelined. Um, I would say that the key thing to highlight here is not to see issues, that, not issues, challenges that women face, maybe that are related to periods or menstruation or menopause as diseases. That's not a disease because I somehow feel that we started seeing menopause as a disease. You know, let's let's raise more awareness because women going through menopause are in this hell of a nightmare period of their lives. Yes, some of it might be nightmare, but menopause as such is not a disease because we have to treat it in a way that we alleviate symptoms of menopause, same as, you know, heavy periods or endometriosis for some, so they can really feel better and then you can cater to them better as, a, let's say, employer, right? Mm -hmm. Everything that's abnormal, too heavy periods, too much pain, that is problematic and you have to cater to those people, but those people should be getting 
benefits of, I don't know, sick leave already. They don't have to be a woman. You know, if I'm feel not feeling well and I have endometriosis, which is classified as a medical uh, issue, I it doesn't it doesn't make a difference if I'm a woman or a man, let's say. Like I have an issue and I have to get a treatment for that and I need to um, get, a, get a benefit about that from my employer anyway. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> I think the first step towards everything is really making a distinction what is really problematic because it's stopping us from our everyday activities um, and how do we support that? Mm-hmm. Um, periods or anything else is not a problem as long as it's a normal occurrence. That's mm-hmm. absolutely normal and we should treat it as that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a, a, a quite a lot of polarization that I also see in the space. If we look at men of us, for example, I think it's awesome that we are not dismissing it as something that's not worth uh, our attention. At the same time, there's two challenges. One is, is somebody trying to capitalize too much from just making menopause another new market uh, Mm -hmm. that brings a lot of money? And the second thing is, when we try to talk about the challenges some women uh, undergo when undergoing menopause, that can also create a potential uh, intentional or unintentional bias against, uh, you know, women in a certain age. And I find that quite uh, scary for women. You know, do we have to, you know, in every period of our life now worry, how are we going to be seen? You know, 30 to 40, you're going to have kids, so you can't, you know, uh, be an appropriate candidate for promotions. Uh, 45 plus uh, to 55 uh, you're going through menopause, so, you know, you're not uh, stable in the mental health yeah. uh, state. So you'll, have, wh- you'll have too many hot flushes, right? Like, yeah, 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 yeah. So what kind of discourses do you see? What kind of innovation? And how are these questions that I mentioned uh, being addressed in the best possible way? Yeah, that's an excellent point. And I always say, you know, whatever decision you make, always base everything on data. Because if you can base something on data, then you can find a really good, you know, point towards you should be going or direction you should be going to. Um, It has been proven that women that are going through menopause that have, um, you know, symptoms that are not, that are stopping them from, let's say, performing optimally at work, really do cost the employer, the society, the healthcare system, more money than women that are not going through menopause. So let's address those issues. But those women also, you know, they bring, they have wisdom, they have knowledge. We cannot dismiss them just because of menopause. So as long as we take everything good, let's say that's within that category of women, their wisdom, their knowledge, their years of experience, everything that they're bringing to the table and support them in a way that we can address everything that they are facing that's negatively impacting their performance. I think that's great. Um, As with everything in women's health space or any other industry, there will be always be, you know, when it comes to innovation and what's out there, there will always be gimmicks. There will always be things that are really not that much needed. There will always be someone who's trying to jump on the bandwagon of this new movement, which in this case, Femtech is, I would say. There will always be people who, um, you know, will try to milk the cow, so to say. And that is that. That's the, mm-hmm. that's the case in any other sector. Um, femtech or women's health uh, and, and technology movement now is uh, picking up the pace a lot last few years. And I think because it's so um, inevitably blurred and overlapped by other sectors such as well-being, and longevity and you know health as a broader as a broader category um we just have to see it as a place where you know not everything will be optimal to use not everything will be based on clinical trials that's why i think it's really important to educate patients and educate consumers about what's out there so they can make really informed decision not everything is needed what's out there not everything will move the needle for us in terms of how you know beneficial will it be for our health it's up to us consumers to educate ourselves But also on the other side, uh, it's a role of those who are manufacturing these devices or or manufacturing these supplements or whatever there is 
to educate us and be transparent. And I think that's one of the key issues I'm seeing in this industry, not not having enough transparency because we have to approach consumers uh, from an average point of view. They are average people. They are not people with medical background, at least not most of them. They're not people who have scientific background. They're not people who know where to get maybe all the latest information about certain product. So it's our role as uh, as makers, designers, uh, producers, manufacturers of these to be transparent. Uh, because everything we do, we do for the patient and consumer. It, we would be... I mean, all of this would be obsolete if there wasn't be someone who's, you know, using that or paying that. So that's something mm-hmm. companies should have in mind. You've been in the space for the last six years, as you mentioned. Uh, what do you observe in ter- terms of trends that are occurring? So what is the big topic in 2023 in women's health specifically? Mm-hmm. Um There were loads. I think one of the really good trends that I've seen is that Fertility, as you as you early, uh, mentioned earlier, um, is not seen all only as a women's issue. For example, we are now finally, you know, opening this big Pandora box of infertility and everything that's related to it, and we are realizing that probably half of the cases is due to um, problems on a male side. And there are really some great companies out there that are really democratizing access to better diagnostics. I would say for um, in men's health, specifically reproductive health, you know, you have these great kits that you can use at home from several companies. And, you know, you can probably, you know, establish whether there might be something problematic on your end. And I think before, you know, men um, wouldn't be so thoroughly checked and maybe, uh, you know, even dismissed as a cause, potential cause for infertility. Now the, 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 the shift has happened in just general knowledge and awareness about that. So I think that's really great. <clears throat> then I would say a big trend is definitely uh, mental health, which I've seen this year, which has emerged already during the pandemic, but after the pandemic, even more so because healthcare systems, at least state funded healthcare systems are very clogged, at least here in the UK. You know, they cannot cope with the demand anymore. I've seen it firsthand here in the UK, how NHS has Really, the quality of the service has deteriorated, unfortunately, over the past nine, 10 years since I've been here. So uh, the only solution is to democratize access to these services by <clears throat> telehealth or, uh, you know, technology, because the prevention will become the key. You, you have to act as a patient and as a consumer and the, the, the system has to act before you become patient uh, because then it's already too late, right? So prevention is a big trend that I'm seeing this year, whether it's mental health, whether it's many other areas of our health. Um, and How, that ties... can, I just ask, yeah. can I just ask something? So when you say that the men- mental health is a trendy topic inside of women's health, how, mm-hmm. does it dif- how does it differ, you know, men, women, mental health? Why, you know, is that... Is that really a topic uh, in women's health or is it a broad topic? It's a bit of both. So I want to, you know. Yeah, it's definitely a bit of both. But I think within women's health, it's emerging as part of some other areas like maternal health. I think, for example, definitely enough emphasis wasn't put on uh, maternal health in the context of mental health or the other way around. Like, um, And now we are realizing that, you know, women cannot our journey when it comes to mental health doesn't stop when we give birth to children or doesn't stop when we are not in pms when we are in those other parts of our month where we are not menstruating or whatnot i think the 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 narrative around hormonal health and hormone health has changed and that has really impacted conversations around um around uh, mental health heavily because women's hormonal cycles are 28 to 30 days. Men's are 24 hours, right? So we have to take into account that our mental health is heavily impacted by hormones, although not only uh, hormones, right? Um, and, And we have to understand that women's health is way more complex than we thought. So it's based on Uh, It's affected by, you know, workplace and workplace culture and situation we have at home and childcare and financial health and and a general well-being. Um, It's really hard to be a woman, I would say, in 2023. You know, feminism has brought a lot to us, but it has also put a lot on our plate. And Mm -hmm. um, and I think 
on one side, we are realizing that we can do everything, but we cannot do everything at the same time, at least not equally good and equally well. You know what? I, uh, I recently saw a reel from the CEO of PepsiCo, uh, uh, who's a woman, and she said that uh, it's just difficult all the time. You, exactly. you have kids, you want to you wanna <laughs> advance at work, but your kids need you, then your parents need you, then you're in menopause. And especially as a CEO, you've got three jobs. And the one that's the worst off is always the spouse, you know, because the to-do list is, uh, yeah, company, 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 the two kids, and then there's the spouse. And she said, well, you know, there's two ways of looking at it. You're lucky you're on the list. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, look, I could, uh, I definitely agree. I think, you know, some you will inevitably drop some balls when you become a parent and um, when you juggle everything, especially if you're a working parent, I think it's hard for both men and women, right? There's a lot of pressure on men these days. I, I won't deny that. But I somehow still think that the um, pace of change for women when it comes to our rights and our well-being, whether it's physical or mental, is still way too slow when it comes to being optimal so we can really be our best because the not the point is not for women just to survive in this crazy world with everything that again we have on our to-do list it's really to thrive and i'm not really sure that we are there yet that we can try thrive and i think um child care which you and i touched upon briefly um as well earlier today is is a really important topic there as well Mm -hmm. It's uh, also interesting to look at uh, different markets and the conditions that uh, women or men are in. If you just look at the maternity leaves, mm -hmm. they are much more friendly or considerate, I would say, in Europe compared to the US. Um, and um, I guess the, the interesting thing with these topics is as you said with mental health you know it's related to so many factors the environment work that you there's no single point solution that can really address an issue and solve it because the underlying causes are so diverse so what kind of technologies inspire you if we say at in mental health mm -hmm. what did you see that's interesting technologically um that goes potentially beyond meditation because if if we're talking about hormonal imbalances you can't you know necessarily just meditate everything away exactly. there's other means that you exactly. might need i don't know that's a good point i think i think in general for example for me telehealth has been a massive uh game changer right um and i think telehealth has opened so many doors for so many people because um you can get fairly affordable service uh, and good service without needing to see your doctor. Um, in the context of mental health, there's a really cool company um, I wrote for Forbes uh, maybe two years ago, SESH. So it's online access to psychologists and, uh, you know, psychology professionals. You don't need to go to your psychologist or psychiatrist uh, office. You, you, can, you can access it online, whether it's in group whether it's one-on-one -on -one, and it's cheaper than what you would have to pay. Especially, I think that's important for U.S. audience because, you know, people in U.S., they already pay way too more for healthcare services than we pay here in, in the U.K., for example. We sometimes take for granted what we get, get from, you know, state-funded healthcare. We, you know, we can complain about it and moan about it, but at the end of the day, you know, when I compare different markets, what people are getting in the U.S., to your point, and what people are getting here, it's way better here. And then on the other side, you know, when we think about, I don't know, maternal policies, we are still not there. You know, way more companies than not don't offer equal paternity leave for men, same as they would offer to women. You know, you might find this maybe in some, you know, really top tier companies or corporates or banks or maybe, you know, top tech companies like Meta. But unfortunately, it's not widely recognizable as something not needed, but also beneficial because child benefits from having both parents with them in that in those earliest months or a first year um, and equally women benefit. Because if you can go back to work after six months and you know that your child is safe with their dad, that's great. And, and, and I think that should be um, encouraged. Um, and I think something that we also tend to forget is that Private health insurance is something that is uh, is speeding up in terms of 
what's happening in the in, in many countries. And I think inevitably it will overspill from, you know, US towards Europe more. I already see that. Uh, if you will want to get a really good healthcare service, you will, I think, inevitably the next five to 10 years, you will have to have a private subscription like for private health insurance. It's almost inevitable. Um, in my home country, Croatia, for example, we have, uh, again, compared to the UK, very affordable private healthcare service. You know, I, when I compare prices, it's way cheaper to get it there than here. Um, but the state funded healthcare systems are facing uh, challenges everywhere. And that's how I think will remain. So the technology is one of the answers here. I think technology can solve some issues. Some issues it can't, can't solve, right? Like women with endometriosis, you cannot, your problem cannot be solved by using an app. You need to see a qualified uh, a medical professional and they need to see you and they need to take you seriously and they need to perform some tests on you in order to, you know, for you to get a diagnosis. That's the only way how we can do it. So we short that, I don't know, time frame, which was like, what, seven, eight years for an average woman to, who has endometriosis to get diagnosed. That's insane. That's really insane. But that won't be possible through the use of technology. That's possible only through better education of healthcare professionals, uh, making those periods of when you actually start noticing the issues until you get seen and, you know, all these tests done on you to get shorter. Um, and women need to start being better advocates for them, but also healthcare professionals need to start seeing them in a more serious way. Because I mm -hmm. had a case of uh, my own case of being, you know, medically gaslit and not being trusted as a patient. So sometimes I was really in a situation where I had to treat myself the best way I could because doctors just simply didn't trust me. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, the changes that are happening in healthcare systems, uh, in Europe, public systems, transitioning uh, to a more private uh, setting for, for various reasons. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the question that I'm kind of thinking of here is, where do you see the relationship between technology and innovation that's out there and policy that needs to have to change mm -hmm. in order to enable better care? So how uh, much tension are you observing in topics around, for example, women and entrepreneurship, maternity leave and pregnancy, topics like these? There's a massive gap. There's a massive chasm between what should be and what is, unfortunately. Um, it's, in my opinion, <clears throat> for a ma major issue to be solved, this issue won't be solved by only including two or three key stakeholders in the game. All the key stakeholders need to be included. And what I mean by that, the government needs to be included and policymakers need to be included. We already started seeing this in the UK because now we have Women's Health Strategy for England. We have Women's Health Ambassador, Professor Dame Leslie Reagan. Um, and I think that that is the way to go. Governments need to become more included in the conversation and policy making and financial support and whatever is needed to solve certain issues. And the same thing applies to um, women being entrepreneurs and women getting funding they need and they deserve because to be honest with you, I've been in this space now 10 years um, as, a, as a woman in tech and last seven years as a female founder in tech myself. And I've spoken probably to thousands of founders over that course of time. And I'm under the impression the situation is worse than ever. Um, really, really Why? honestly, it hasn't changed. And I see all these, you know, initiatives and conferences and office hours and mentorship programs and this and that and different organizations, same as my own one, Women of Wearables, right? And I still don't think that we are any closer to the real solution, you know, not same amount, if not less of money is going to female founders, nothing almost has changed, which brings me to, to conclusion that whatever we are doing now, it's not enough. Maybe it's not wrong, but it's simply not enough. And that means mm -hmm. that probably policymakers need to be included, you know, similarly to, I think, what policy uh, makers have done here in the UK. I think every company with 250 and more employees, they have to publicly disclose the salaries or at least the gap between the salaries, because 
I think it's also done in um, on European level. I think European Parliament maybe a few months ago brought the directive where it said act where it said that if the salary for the same job um, for both men and women is bigger than five percent, then they should rectify it, and it has to be you know you know done all over again because the 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 gap shouldn't be more than five percent. And I think that's the way to go. You know, if you cannot do it on a micro level from one employer to the other. You have to do it on a on a policy making level, and the same thing applies, I think, to funding. I think unless we see it being somehow somehow regulated, unfortunately, um, or being done on a level of funds or any organizations that are um, allocating funds, you know, nothing will change. Still, more money will go to male founders than female founders, and I think it's also a culture problem. Problem. I don't think it's a pipeline problem. An excuse I've heard so many times from all sorts of, you know, organizations and VCs and angels. You know, oh, there's not enough female founders. Oh, there's we just cannot find them. That's absolutely not true. Um, there's there's more than enough in the pipeline. I think it's a culture problem. I th- unless you start seeing women as a audience that deserves to be treated, treated, quote unquote, by uh, as as really good business opportunity, unless you start seeing women who are building these businesses as a good business opportunity, nothing will change. We We have to start seeing women as someone who's decision making when it comes to where do we spend the money and someone someone who deserves to be seen as as uh, you know forward thinking open minded category of consumers that will really make a big decisions about where do we spend the money in the future and we have to start seeing female founders in such way as well so let's challenge the assumption that the market isn't big enough and that there's not enough uh, female founders for the the uh, potential to, of investors to actually make some uh, returns. Um, what kind of business models have you seen that have been proven to work and sustainable in the long run? Mm-hmm. What's really working well in this segment of the digital health space? That's a good one. I think the shift that I'm seeing now, uh, after I've been in femtech space for about five, six good years, is that um, founders are realizing, and just investors are realizing, and I think this is also driven by uh, trends in the industry, is that consumers are very flickery and it, it takes a lot of money to acquire a consumer and B2C and D2C business models work really well, maybe for some businesses, but what really sticks, what it's a bit stickier, what investors really love is B2B or at least B2B2C. So I see a lot of fintech businesses actually focusing on enterprises, having subscription business models, working with hospitals, working with insurers, working with, you know, buyers and payers who are not just individual consumers like you and me. I think that's a big shift that I'm seeing because that's also something that brings serious money. And again, investors love money if you decide to go that down route, that route. I think what I've seen also in the biotech space is a whole new set of uh, femtech companies at the intersection of women's health and biotechnology. And that's also something that, you know, investors love. And that's also something that pharma companies love because collaboration is the key, I would say, or or at least, you know, acquisition down the line. Um, And I think that there has some have been some really, really excellent businesses that I've seen this year um, innovating in women's health, specifically gynecological cancers, for example, um, innovating in, I don't know, smear tests uh, that, you know, disrupt completely disrupting this industry Uh, or, or also in the medical device space, I think way more exits we'll see in uh, in medical device and biotech space than any other when it comes to women's health and rightfully so. But then the timeline between the idea until you actually have something tangible is very long in these in these sectors and and that's the reality of it and investors know that and we all know that but look it's healthcare you cannot just you know stick something on it and have a finished and ready made product that's ready to sell in 3 months maybe you can with some businesses but i think healthcare is a specific one so i think those kinds of med- business models will definitely stick anything that's i think r and d driven is very very important I think also because I'm a big fan of everything that's supported by data. I'm a big fan of have, of businesses that have clinical trials and data that support their claims. I wish we'd see more of that in femtech space and women's health space. I'm under the impression that 
you know, a lot out there is not supported by clinical trials. There hasn't been enough real research done into how beneficial is something. Um, and especially in those, I call it um, vitamin supplement space, right? Like a lot of companies are not selling us the painkillers. They are selling us vitamins and for women's health because it has so been long overlooked and underfunded under researched we need real painkillers we don't need something you know to just to soothe our problems we need a real solution so but the real solution can be made and done only by really diving deep into the industry having that product market fit founder market fit and having again clinical trials and doing thorough research into why is this needed? Why is this needed now? And how does it actually help women? Um, and I really hope we see more of that. And I think when we look at, again, exits, I think yesterday I read um, about a pharma company acquiring a super cool menopause startup, uh, Bonafide Health. They acquired them for, I think, 400 plus million, which is excellent for a biotech company that exists only for six years. Um, I think I think that's a way to go, at least in that space. Mm -hmm. What keeps you optimistic about the space? Are there any uh, solutions? Again, I'm I'm just trying to think of concrete examples mm -hmm. that uh, you thought were really, um, really inspiring. You know, when it comes to uh, menstrual health, for example, or fertility, I thought the debate that happened in the U.S. with all the changes in the last few years around the abortion rights mm -hmm. was really, really scary where it was. basically if you tracked your cycles um, and a third party that was doing that sold your data to, to someone else, you could be, you know, subjected to yeah. criminal charges because somebody might have deduced that you were pregnant and you had an abortion based on, on your uh, menstrual cycle uh, data. So maybe we can touch upon mm -hmm. that uh, a bit. Yep. And also the, the optimistic uh, things, the, yes. the, you know, the inspiring things. Yeah. So first part, uh, Handmaid's Tale meets 1984, right? I always say that. Um, we live in very strange times uh, and it's scary when you think about it. To be a woman today and to live somewhere like that. And we had really real life stories from women in our community who would share with us you know, I was pregnant 20 weeks and my my child was unhealthy and I needed to get an abortion and I had to go to Canada to get an abortion. I had to go all the way across the U.S. to get an abortion in another country. And it's insane when you think about it, because it's not just, oh, I don't want to keep the child, which I believe should be everyone's choice. Right. I'm not pro this or pro that. I'm always pro choice. That's the key. So I think some really interesting collaborations that I've seen this year, specifically in period tracking fertility space, the most recent one, Clue and Aura, uh, a stroke collaboration. Um, I wrote for Forbes about um, natural cycles that had a, had a partnership and has a partnership with Samsung and their latest uh, generation of smartwatches. So integrating a small... Features from a very innovative but small startup and company into someone who's a giant and has an offering, but may, they may be lacking some features and they have seen that, well, actually, you know, we are not catering to enough women. We are missing out on this huge audience. But instead of, you know, reinventing the wheel and doing everything, let's partner with someone who already has great credibility, who has great users, great number of users, who has who has built trust between them and those users. And let's see how we can work together. And I think that really makes me optimistic for 2024 and beyond because you know partnerships are really crucial they're really the key and collaborations of that kind because no one can succeed on their own and i think with the current investment climate specifically where a lot of startups even startups i would say that are more established and have scaled up are struggling with investment and getting invested you know made investment I think the collaborations of that kind will be the key because ultimately you want to be sustainable financially, right? And I think one way of doing that is by partnering with um, a large player. Now, the <clears throat> and that's a positive outcome uh, that I'm hoping to see more. Um, and I see through that, we'll also see some new um, 
might see some new solutions and some new avenues, which inevitably we might not know now, but we will know about consumers, you know, which they like, which, which stuff they like, which features they like, which they dislike. Um, and we'll find out more about them because I think it's all about the data. You know, it really hurts me to see that so many great companies out there, they collect a lot of data. They have this incredible pool of insights into consumers' behaviors, but in many cases, probably more often than not, they don't know what to do with that data and how to interpret it correctly and how what to do with it. And I'm hoping that that will become even bigger area of focus for many companies in 2024 and beyond. You know, what do we do with data? D data is the currency of the future, you know. Um, and I also hope that consumers will become more empowered by the knowledge about the importance of their data. What do we do with our data? You know, how do we protect it? Even if we do disclose something, you know, who do we disclose it to? What do they do with it? I think in Europe we have this, um, some might argue, but I would, I would say it's still good policy around GDPR. Um, we'll see how that pans out, you know, for, you know, cross collaborations, cross geographical collaborations between US companies and European companies and so on. But um, I think the data is the, always the way to go. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I agree that from the consumer perspective, you can feel somehow safe in Europe that your data is protected and at least on paper. <laughs> Yeah, exactly, exactly, and and uh, we'll see what happens now with the EU AI Act. Uh, oh yes, which uh, yeah is going to be massive the next area big thing. that is still very gray. Yeah, 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 yeah. Still many open questions. I would say I the comment that I liked most so far was uh, how long it took uh, for MDR to become a law. Uh, to it being uh, implemented, you know, uh, there the industry didn't have enough time to really adjust to the MDR, mm -hmm. so there were extensions in terms of um, the introduction of the legislation. So we'll see how fast companies will move, which companies will move. There's worries that basically only large companies are really the the ones that are going to have the funding uh, and the means to actually be compliant with with the laws. With so, the laws, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, what are your expectations in terms of the current atmosphere, you know, in the digital health space and investments? It's not exactly optimistic, uh, I would say. So how do you see that that might impact the, the field of women's oh. health? My impression is that uh, the field is maturing, which also means that uh, there's a higher barrier to entry because there's so many requirements that you need to take into account clinical trials, data quality, uh, AI Act, and other regulations like GDPR that are uh, general. And then there's specifically uh, those for, for healthcare. So what's your uh, observation or prediction or expectation for, yeah. for the next year or two? Um, from from my experience, I think we've we've seen dramatic increase in numbers of in number of companies um, within women's health space. You know, when I compare the situation how it was maybe five six years ago, you know, there certainly were that many companies focusing on menstrual health, or maternal health, or pregnancy. Right. So the market in certain areas has definitely become saturated. Um, again, there's a lot may, might be there. I won't say a lot, but there's definitely some that might not be as needed and some other ones. But that's a good thing because everything that's a that's a that comes with the territory, right? When you become too crowded, fil fil you'll filter out some things. So that's that's a good thing. Competition is good. It makes us become even better at what we do, right? So I, I think that's a good thing. I think when it comes to investment, I'll give you a very plastic example of how I feel. Like this morning, I opened uh, a Rock Health's newsletter and they have a section where they um, highlight the investments in the space. And this morning, there were only two highlights. And usually there's like six, seven of them. And that really was like, okay, like the industry has, like the investment space is really having problems. I don't think there's such a massive shortage of money, in my opinion. I just think that VCs are sitting on their money and not investing. And I see this, again, firsthand from our community at WOW, because we get literally daily 
inquiries from startup founders who are fundraising, especially those that are raising pre-seed and seed. I think down the line, when you go to towards Series A and later, you already have a pool of investors. Like you won't, you know, dabble in the dark that much. You already have your lead investors from previous rounds and they might open some doors for you or you might have a big lead investor. But I think in those earliest stages, there's a real struggle for money. And I think in women's health, it's even more highlighted by the fact that um, there's not a pool of, you know, money that you can get very easily through grants, through philanthropy, through, you know, some different awards and stuff like that. There is a lot out there, but none of that is big enough. None of that will actually move the needle for these startups. So, um, and, and many of of these competitions or applications are very cumbersome by, you know, logistics and paperwork and so much red tape. And, and, and there's three decision-making or four or five decision-making layer processes. And it takes so much time and like three months in the life of a startup can really make a difference. You know, you, you might be dead in three months as a company and lack of, I would say also good angels, you know, Europe is a big market. There's so many different countries. We're not as big as us and, you know, who are the angels that invest in, in specifically women's health. And I constantly get the same narrative from founders in my community and my network, you know, especially female founders. We were hoping that more women will invest in us, but in 90% of all cases, male founders invest in us. There's a real shortage of female investors. There might be some really great angels that I also know. There's some really great groups here in the UK of angel investors, but I'm still under the impression that men are those that invest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, it's very interesting because I remember um, a few years ago. I'm not sure if it was this year or last year. There was this study that came out, mm -hmm. uh, which was really depressing because it highlighted that basically women who got funding from female investors had a more difficult time getting funding in the second round because there was this impression that the initial funding wasn't based on merit but was based mm. more on women supporting women yeah. i don't know if you saw that i saw that i saw that and i think that look it does it does hold some water that whole narrative i i won't i won't lie um, I think it, diversity is always the key just because we are female founded or female focused business doesn't mean we have to exclude men from the conversation. I think it's always beneficial to include men. Um, I wonder whether the, the, the conversations around, oh, it was hard for these founders to raise money because they raised for women was coming more from men than women later down the line. Um, I do feel, though, that in many cases, men do feel alienated when we talk about women's health. Some might not understand what's women's health, like, you know, what's the fuss about. Some might think women as consumers and patients are niche. We are not. Um, some might think that some might not even understand what, why are we building what we are building. I've heard many of those stories where, you know, male investors simply don't understand why are we now making a new uh, speculum, let's say, or new smear test, because what's already there has been there for 20, 30, 50 years. Like, you know, why do we need something? So there needs to be a lot of education. Women's health is the one of those industries where there needs to be way more education about, um, you know, what what we uh, what we put out there and why and why is that needed why is that disruption needed right so like red blue ocean blue ocean um, and investors need to be part of that group that needs to be educated as well because I'm mm -hmm. I think that if they if they would understand more and could um, identify themselves more with the problem they would see the opportunity there there as well it's not just oh it's a nice to have thing it's a must have thing for women because. You have a wife, you have a partner, you have a daughter, you have a mother, right? Like every man on this planet has one or more women within their immediate circle that they care about. And that's why they should care about, about women's health as well. Perfect. I think this is uh, where we can, where, where we can conclude the discussion. So Maria, thanks again. Uh, for all the insights. And this is exactly why we are here to raise the awareness to uh, start discussions and debates so we can all learn something new thank you so much for having me okay.